Welcome to Gruesome, your horrific true crime podcast. I am Connie, along with person who doesn't think in and out is all that great, Meg. <laughs> That's not what I said. <laughs> and, uh, she's going to tell us today about the Grimes sisters. I, do, I think in and out is good. I like in and out She thinks all fast food's the same. I don't. I just think that it's romanticized and it's not like the epitome of all fast food. Okay, Gordon Ramsay, tell <laughs> us about <laughs> two pieces of bread on either side of your head right now. Psh. <laughs> okay, okay. We can get into it, but I will give you some trigger warnings. Um, murder, obviously. Like minimal sexual assault, but it's there. Um, it's not like graphic. We'll say that. And children, they're teenagers. Doesn't they're matter. Not like babies. Still yeah, I know. It still sucks. It sucks. Yeah, it does. And we can get right into it. That's fine. Because it was only a few days after Christmas on December 28th. 1956, that sisters Patricia and Barbara Grimes had pooled their money in order to go see the movie Love Me Tender, starring none other than Elvis Presley. They had seen it almost a dozen times already, but they, like many other young girls in 1956, they loved Elvis. They had recently signed up for his fan club and were eagerly awaiting their membership cards in the mail. At 9.30, they were at the theater and they grabbed popcorn before heading in. But that was the last time that Patricia, who was 12, and Barbara, who was 15, were seen again. The girls grew up in the neighborhood, uh, in a neighborhood in Chicago called McKinley Park, which at the time was a very working-class neighborhood. It was full of hard-working people who occasionally liked to treat themselves. And it wasn't often during this time that girls, especially young teen girls, just went missing. Barbara Jean was born May 5, 1941, and Patricia Kathleen was just a few days shy of her 13th birthday. Her birthday was December 31st, 1943. They lived with their single mother and three other siblings. Barbara had talked to their mother, Loretta, into letting them go to this movie. They got their money together and it was enough for bus fare there and back, tickets to watch the movie twice, and popcorn. It was $2.50. I wish. I'm trying to live in that kind of economy. <laughs> because I think it's like $20 a piece when you go to the movies now. Like just for the tickets. And popcorns, I never another seven or $8,000. <laughs> 30000 They set off at 7.15. And they told their mom goodbye, giving her a kiss on the cheek. Loretta expected the girls home no later than midnight that Friday because they were watching the movie two times. They weren't just going to see it once, they were going to see it both times. But when the girls hadn't arrived by 12.30, she sent Barbara and Patricia's 17-year-old sister, Teresa, and their 14-year-old brother, Joey, to the bus stop to wait for them. Three buses came and went at the bus stop closest to their home, and the sisters did not emerge from any of them. The teenagers found a police officer and made a report. All of the officers on the night shift were informed of the girls. Then all of the, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Give me a second. All officers on the night shift were informed of the missing girls that night. When their mother called the police station at 2 a.m., she gave them a description of the girls, and once again, officers were told to be on the lookout for two girls, 15 and almost 13. One had been wearing jeans and a yellow sweater, a white scarf, and a black jacket, 
and the other girl had been wearing a gray skirt, a yellow top, a long coat with a gray scarf. They were both wearing black shoes. Photos were taken of the Grimes sisters' friends wearing like the same outfits in hopes that someone's memory might be jogged if they saw the photo. That reminds me of the Anita Coffee case where they had like, um, they recorded like one of her friends and like the same thing. Mm-hmm. Or her sister. I can't remember which one it was. Yeah. If you see maybe someone this size, this age wearing it, it'll all come together for you. The search continued from Friday night into Saturday and through the weekend. By Patricia's birthday that Monday, their descriptions were printed in all of the newspapers and police worked incredibly hard looking for these kids. They were concerned maybe they had gotten locked in a freight car at the train station, so railroad detectives were looking for them. They were going door to door, covering every possible inch of the area that these girls had last been seen in. They had school children packing and mailing out missing person flyers. Like instead of classwork, they were all putting them in and sending them out. And this, because this wasn't a time you could just shoot an email to someone. No, but no still, Amber Alerts. No, but still, precincts across the country knew about the missing Grimes girls. The community came together because it was unexpected, but it was also terrifying. Just the year before, three teenage boys had disappeared after they had seen the movie The African Lion at the Loop Theater and then went bowling. They were later found naked, mutilated, and murdered in a wooded area on the outskirts of Chicago. But that memory rang like an alarm bell in the heads of the community. Which I am going to do that case soon because I had another one that also linked to it on the backlog and I just like went down a really big rabbit hole with Mm -hmm. these. I do that sometimes. Three cases. I was like, I'm going to have to do a part two, I think. So that will be coming, I think. Anyways, the last confirmed sighting came from Dorothy Weiner a friend of the girls that had sat with them during the first showing of Love Me Tender. Dorothy had left after that showing with her younger sister and made it home, only to be shocked the next morning when Joey Grimes knocked on her door asking if his sisters were with her or if she had seen them. This was the only sighting that seemed legitimate, but there were tons of others. Day after day, police received dozens of tips and sightings, Some were wild, and they spanned the entire city of Chicago and further. A bus driver suggested that he had seen them get off of his bus at 11.05 that night. A security guard said that he gave the girls directions on the morning of December 29th, but only remembered because they had been incredibly rude to him and told him to shut up. That didn't really match the girls' character. They couldn't rule it out but it just didn't seem like them. Classmates and other teenagers said that they had seen them walking around town, passing them by while the whole city was supposedly looking for them. Their poor mother received a phone call from a young girl who called out, it's Petey, this is Petey. And Petey was Patricia's nickname, but it was just a horrible prank. Oh, I know. I hate that. You think, <laughs> I guess I just have this fake image of, I don't know, just morality in the 50s, just how it's been painted. And the idea that people were doing prank stuff like that, like kids, is just gross to me. Even then, ugh. The police captain was convinced that the girls had run away from home. And eventually Elvis himself made a plea. He said that if they were truly Elvis Presley fans, they should go home and stop worrying their mother. Oh, there were rumors that they had run off to Nashville to try to see him in concert or they were trying to get to his home. But again, they didn't take any money that they they didn't have any money. They didn't take if they were running away. Her their mother said that they would have taken their brand new radios that they had just gotten for Christmas. Yeah. Just wasn't the type of girls that they were. 
Barbara had just given her entire paycheck and Christmas bonus to help her mom pay bills. A random girl wrote a letter to Ann Landers in her advice column. And it stated that while looking for a seat, Betty, this girl, noticed Barbara and Pat Grimes sitting with some other kids. Outside of the show, we all got to talking and we exchanged phone numbers. When we got to the street where we turned off, we said goodbye and ran across the street. Then Betty forgot something that she had to tell Barbara and ran back to the corner. A man of about 22 or 25 was talking to them. He pushed Barbara into the back seat of a car and Pat into the front seat. We got part of the license number as the car drove by us. The first four numbers were 2184. Betty thinks that there were three or four numbers after that. They didn't think much about it, but it struck them as kind of funny. And when we heard that they were missing, we just didn't know what to do. So Ann Landers gets this letter, and the police pull it, but they can't verify it. The license numbers bring nothing. But sightings are still pouring in constantly, some from as far away as Nashville, saying that they had been seen in Nashville and they had tried to get a job at the temp at a temp office and that they the lady at the temp office confirmed that yes she had pulled the names of two girls with the last name Grimes. Oh. So they're getting them from all over. On January 12th, 15 days after her daughter's first disappeared, Loretta Grimes had to go to Milwaukee, Wisconsin with FBI agents after she received three letters demanding $1,000 for the safe return of Pat and Barb. The letters left strange instructions demanding that she go to a department store, a church, and a hotel in the downtown Milwaukee area. She was supposed to go to each place at 11 a.m. and then again at 11 p.m. After that, she was supposed to wait at the church with ransom money, and she promised that Barbara would come and retrieve the money deliver it to the kidnapper, and then both Pat and Barbara would be freed. Loretta waited on that bench for hours, and no one ever came. Afterwards, the letters were traced back to a psychiatric patient at the VA in Lake County, Illinois. On January 14th, Ann Tolston answered the phone twice around midnight. Ann's daughter, Sandra, was a, fan of Pat, was a friend of Pat and Barb's. The first phone call was silent. They waited, waited a few minutes. Tolston hung up the phone. The second phone call returned a scared voice saying, Is that you, Sandra? Sandra, are you there? Before she could even get to her daughter, the line hung up, but Anne was convinced that it had been her friend Patricia. Strange links continued. On January 15th, a switchboard operator for the Chicago PD took a call from a man who said that he had dreamed about those two missing girls and that they were dead and they could be found in Santa Fe Park at 91st and Wolf. He hung up, but the call was traced to Walter Kranz, a 53-year-old man. He was taken into custody after January 22nd when the girls were found no less than a half mile away from where he dreamed them to be. On the afternoon of January 22nd, Leonard Prescott, a 39-year-old, was driving over a bridge that crossed a small creek. From his car, he looked just past the guardrail and was able to see something that appeared to be, quote, flesh-colored things underneath the railing, unquote. Leonard thought the same thing that we have found most people think when they are about to find a body. Is that a mannequin? No. Nope, it's not. He rushed home to get his wife, Marie, and they drove to the bridge on German Church Road that he had crossed. When they got out of the car, Marie fell to her knees sobbing because under a layer of snow were the frozen nude bodies of Patricia and Barbara Grimes. The couple drove straight to the police station and police from all over northeastern Illinois arrived at the crime scene. From everywhere, 
The girl's father, Joe Grimes, also arrived and positively identified the young girls. Walter Kranz was taken into custody and explained, <laughs> he said he was a psychic. He said that he was kind of a psychic. And he said he had this dream about a field of trees in a small creek and that there were two naked bodies that looked like mannequins laying in the field, which is exactly what Leonard Prescott had first thought when he drove over the small mm -hmm. creek and found them. But Crank was given, or Kranz, I'm sorry, was given a glowing reference from his boss despite being absent four times between December 28th and his arrest. He said his wife had been sick. Loretta Grimes had received another letter separate from the first ones from Milwaukee demanding $5,000 be left in a locker at a nearby rail station. And handwriting experts were certain that Kranz was responsible for the letter. But there was just simply no actual evidence outside of that. So they kind of just chalked it up to the fact that maybe he was one of these fanatics that just wanted to be involved. Yeah. But how would he know so close? Like, yeah, I mean, an extraordinary guess. Who knows? Now, at the time, the murders of the three boys who had been found dumped in that wooded area were unsolved. So police immediately linked the two together when they found Barb and Pat. But I under I understand why they link them together, but how often do you see an MO where they're targeting like both teen boys and teen girls? Yeah, it's not like common. It's always just one or the other, or even like or a couple. Especially if like they're just, like nude and sexually motivated. Yeah. That would be odd. Mm-hmm. I thought so too, but I can see why they would link. Yeah, them. absolutely. I could see the link, but it's just knowing what we know now, it's makes you be like hmm yeah it doesn't really work like that the scene of the crime uncovered an old beer can a pipe cleaning tool and a fully packaged toy sheriff set none of those things brought back any kind of evidence and due to the sheer number of officers and various precincts that showed up to the crime scene they trampled everything there was no way to see any footprints any markings or if anyone had left anything that could be valuable to the case at the bridge police and journalists both noted the horrific condition of the girls before they were removed from the crime scene so a newspaper actually reported that pat's abdomen had ugly wounds and that she looked as though she had a broken nose and that same article reported that Barb's face had been bruised and it looked as though she had had an ice pick go through her chest. But their autopsy was an, unable to provide any further detail about what happened to the girls. Despite reports from three pathologists, none of them could agree on a time or a cause of death because of what they said, how clean the girls were. So all of that stuff that the reporters had got to the scene of the crime and seen and reported on, they didn't report that. That wasn't, that was inconclusive with their findings. They concluded that they had died from secondary shock resulting from exposure to the elements on December 28th, the night that they had gone missing. But if they had died that night, how had there been so many sightings of them in following days? The bridge where they were found was busy enough that surely someone would have seen them in the full month that it had been. Their bodies were frozen at the time, but it had only gotten cold enough after January 7th for them to have frozen the way that they were. So people were like, wouldn't that mean they would have died after January 7th? Where were they for those other two weeks? Yeah, because otherwise, I mean, if they were if the bodies had been in kind of like a preserved status due to the cold and the, you know, the elements, that's not the view that the reporters and police officers would have seen if they had died prior to that and been exposed to the elements and then froze like decomp would have set it. It would have been. Yeah. They did both 
test positive for semen on their swabs, but nothing looked forcible. It looked, and they didn't know, but it looked like it could have been consensual as well. So there was nothing. They just said that they had died from shock due to the cold. Loretta was beside herself, as she should be, but she had already lost one of her older daughters, who was 26 at the time of her death because she had a bad kidney operation. The community came together and gave Loretta enough money to pay for the girl's funeral and to pay off her mortgage, which helped because she hadn't been able to work in the time that they had been missing. And their funeral was held on January 28th. A woman called police to report that she had driven by the location of the girls' bodies an hour before Leonard Prescott had. And they had not been there. She was absolutely positive they had not been there. But a trucker said that he had dropped the girls off on the night of December 28th, less than four miles from where they had found. And he said that when he had picked them up, one of them was only wearing a shirt and underwear, and he thought that they were going to rob him. A couple that lived near the location said that their Great Dane had smelled the girls on January 21st. The coroner suggested that due to the condition, they may have been there for weeks with the cold preserving them. But on the morning of December 30th, a cab driver reported to police that he had seen the Grimes sisters at 5 a.m. with two men at a diner. The owners of the restaurant, Minnie Minnie and John DeRose, agreed. They said that the girls had been in with a man who had sideburns like Elvis, and he occasionally came there and did dishes for food. Minnie said that the taller girl looked like she was sick or drunk. She had been staggering and ended up laying her head on the table until she was dragged out by a man named Benny Bedwell, who is the guy with the sideburns. The shorter girl protested. Minnie even claims that she told Benny that the police were searching for those girls and he had better get them home. Several other people corroborated seeing the girls near the diner but the dates began to fall apart. Minnie couldn't remember if it was the 30th or the 6th exactly a week later. She hadn't reported anything sooner because she just really didn't want to get involved. Edward Bendwell, Benny, was born in March of 1936. He went to work for the circus as soon as he turned 18, but inevitably he became a drifter and a little bit of a vagrant before serving six months in the Air Force. When he was around 21, he was arrested in connection to the Grimes case. Bedwell denied knowing the sisters. He claimed that the girls he was with were named Carol and Irene. And sure enough, two girls, Irene and Carol from Grand Rapids, Michigan, came forward as the girls who went to the diner with Bedwell. As soon as they came forward, Benny's story changed. He said that he had been with Barbara and Patricia at the diner. He was charged with their murders on January 27th after he signed a 14-page confession that claimed that he and his friends beat the girls after they declined his sexual advances. That this all happened after after they had been drinking for nights, they had eaten hot dogs, and when Loretta Grimes read his confession, she told them he was lying. And I'm sure, as you might guess, Benny recanted. He had been in custody for four days, being beaten and threatened, and thought that if he confessed, he would be freed. That's what he was told. The autopsy reports on both of the girls supported his recant. There was no alcohol in their system or blood. There were no hot dogs in their digestive systems. The girls had not been beaten to death. Also. Bedwell was clocked in at the Ajax Consolidated Company, which was his job, from 4.19 p.m. on December 28, 1956 to 12.30 a.m. on December 29th, covering the entire time that those girls might have been abducted. Further records confirmed that Bedwell had been working, um, working in Cicero 
<laughs> on the date that he had supposedly murdered them. On February 6th, Bedwell was freed on a $20,000 bond. He was acquitted of the charges. Yeah, $20,000 from 1956. That's crazy. He was acquitted of the charges, but the same year of his acquittal, Bedwell was tried and acquitted again for the 1956 rape of a 13-year-old girl in Oak Hill, Florida. He died in November of 1972, and I will say that the number of people who corroborated seeing Benny with the girls was likely not a fluke. It is very possible that he was with them, and he is a favorite theory. Because this case is still unsolved. Oh, you bitch. (laughs) But wait, there's more. There was Uh, another confession. Another person. There were tons of confessions. I have to say this. There were tons of confessions, and all of them were just people who wanted to be involved. Like, none none of them came to anything. But Max Fleeg was a 17-year-old suspect in the sister's murders. Wrong pipe. I saw you drink that and your eyes get watery. I was like, Mm -hmm. she's going to (laughs) cough. I am. I was trying really hard not to do it. Okay. Max Fleeg was a 17-year-old suspect in the sister's murders. Initially, he was one of the prime suspects, but because he was a kid, Fleeg was protected by... Illinois law. Juveniles were not allowed to have polygraph tests. Sorry. (laughs) Juveniles were not allowed to have polygraph tests. Nonetheless, Chicago police captain Ralph Pataki persuaded the teenager to submit an unofficial polygraph test, which he did. He was like, yeah, okay. And in the course of this unofficial polygraph test, Fleeg allegedly confessed to the murders, but they couldn't legally use the polygraph test against him in court, so they had to release him without charge. In addition to this, police were unable to charge Fleeg with the murders because there was just a lack of physical evidence corroborating his confession that he he had been the one to kidnap and murder both sisters. But Fleeg was actually later jailed for the unrelated murder of a different young woman. Another theory is that a gang of teenage boys picked them up, abused them, and then left them in the cold to die. Again, never been proven. And this case has never been solved, but the author of the book that I read, The Two Lost Girls by Troy Taylor... He believes that none of these people were responsible and that it was actually Charles Leroy Melquist, who would have been 23 at the time of the disappearance. Were they able to test the semen to see if it was from the same person? It didn't say that anywhere. That's a great question. I would imagine that if it had been, they would have said that. I wonder if they just didn't have the DNA testing back then. Well, they Mm. obviously they didn't. So it's. Yeah, they just had the ability to know what it was and if it was there. Oof. But, so he believes that it was Charles Melquist. Melquist had actually been convicted in in September of 1958 for the murder of 15-year-old Bonnie Lee Scott, who he knew before her murder. Her decapitated body had been found two months after her disappearance, less than 10 miles from where the Grimes sisters had been discovered. After the discovery of Bonnie's body, investigators had noted similarities in the murder and the body disposal when comparing to the Grimes sisters. Melquist was never questioned as to anything about them his attorney forbode him to even give anyone the time of day if they asked about it the day after the body of bonnie lee scott was discovered loretta grimes received a phone call from someone who 
again told her that they were responsible for Bonnie's murder. On this phone call, they said, I've committed the perfect crime. This is another one those cops won't solve, and they're not going to bl- blame Bedwell or Barry Cook. Loretta Grimes remained adamant until her death that this had been the same person who had called her in May of 1957 and told her about the deformity on one of her daughter's feet. He had told her, I know that your daughter has crossed toes because two of Patricia's toes crossed over. She told the public that she would never forget that voice, and it was the same person. Charles Melquist was never charged with his alleged involvement, and he died in 2010. (laughs) The end. But there is still hope that they will fully solve it one day. I believe they will. I I have been saying this all year. 2022 and beyond, it is the technology and like the DNA mapping that we can do now. It is like these unsolved cases are going to be solved. I I just know it. I just know it. Especially oh, yeah, when, no. especially in you. cases like this where um there has been a like there have been bodies that have been found. There's evidence that has been taken from them. You know, I just Yeah, they have it. Well, those boys. So they found those boys. They're not linked to them. They didn't solve those boys' murder until 1995 from 1956. And I mean, obviously, Jesus. we've now come a further almost 30 years. But That's insane. It's, I think, as hard as they tried to solve it, it they just didn't have the means necessary one to like track them down from wherever they were and there were so many people trying to get involved and like just throwing there was leads coming from you know nashville wisconsin indiana all linking back to like this same spot and these same two girls what do you think um i'm pretty much on board with that guy's theory of the charles melquist just because his um, the mom's quote about how she received that phone call and she received tons of phone calls again, confessing, demanding money, mm-hmm. pranking her. And she said that this was the only phone call that she got that she was like, this person knows something and they couldn't trace it. But then the day after they found Bonnie, she got a phone call from that same person saying that they killed Bonnie. And so, yes, I do agree with that. Um, But I think that those other guys all sucked as well (laughs) because they, within, you know, years were arrested for various other crimes. So do we think that 300,000 people about these girls? Uh, Do we think that they got in the car? I mean, that would make, if he was 23, that would make sense with, um, the girl who wrote in when she said yeah. that they well they were- had said that they had boyfriends that were like older which honestly you know you think about that time period and like it was not uncommon for a 15 year old girl to be dating a 20 year old guy you know yeah yeah which yes gross but time period not uncommon um And so there were theories that, like, they had gone with their boyfriends and then their boyfriends who were in the Navy um, had, like, gotten together with a gang of guys and pretty much did the same teen teen gang theory that they had been left in the cold. And, like, the trucker who just, you know, said he picked her up in her underwear. Just all these weird... Why did so many people come forward and say something? And honestly, I believe the the Benny Bedwell thing, too. I believe that maybe they were seen with them, him at that diner. There's just so many conflicting things. And unfortunately, like as we know, teen girls 
your family doesn't always know what you're up to. Yeah. And like, bless their mom because she did not deserve any of that. But no. she maintained that the reason that the girls wouldn't be with Benny Bedwell was because he was hanging out in like a very sleazy part of town and he was taking them to bars and he was taking them to like, like hotels essentially. And that's what they had been doing before that, before the girls died. And, um, Loretta was like, they would never have done that. They would never have. And like, I understand Loretta, but you just, you don't, you really don't know. No, like you never want to think the war. Like you never want to think that your kids would put themselves into a situation that could cause them harm, even unknowingly cause them harm. Because you know you never know, and that's the scary part about it. You never know. Maybe you're just like trying to have a good time. You know, it's just weird that they went through the trouble of like asking if they could go to the movie. They like had very specific like this is what I'm, we're doing. That seems to me more like they were abducted versus they were like out partying after yeah. the movie. So the the teen boy gang theory was that they were they were Teresa, the 17-year-old sister. They were there, they knew her. And so they thought like maybe they knew these boys and they got in the car with them and it just got mm-hmm. like like a hey, let's give you hand. a ride. Mm-hmm. It's weird that they if these reporters and like other people who were at the scene no know, like noted the severe condition of the bodies that it was not but the autopsies didn't report any of that and there's just endless questions why was that why could you see it there but not here and like there are very graphic photos of them finding the bodies like the reports that came out were pictures of that exact moment like, you can see them still there on the ground. It's horrifying, honestly. And I don't see that if if it were just, like, one reporter being like, this is how I found the body. Sorry. I would it's understand okay. if it were, like, uh, one one reporter who was claiming that that's the state that they found the bodies in. But it was obviously corroborated by many. Like the general yeah, and there were tons the of officers there who were looking at it and saying, like, Yes, these girls look battered, but then none of the path- none of the cor- coroners or pathologists are like, no, nothing to see. There's nothing here, nothing going on. If so, it kind of wondering guy. if it's like the cold, maybe that like maybe frostbite or something could have made it look like that. It could, because they had been frozen and they had to wait for them to thaw before they could perform the autopsy. I just also, I'm going to say this, a 12-year-old fifteen and a 15-year-old who are found nude, fully nude in the elements, I would be hard-pressed to see like how they were like, to oh. To say that wasn't a sexually motivated crime. Mm-hmm. Or like mm-hmm. maybe the sex was consensual. And what I think when that do you is a ha- product of the times as well. I agree. I agree. Because in what in what consensual sexual encounter are you having at the same time as your sister and you both are found like that? Yeah. That's sus and that's bullshit. Because the and the twelve I mean, again, different time period. Cause like now I think like a 12 year old, like, oh my God, no. Like it wouldn't have been handled like that. And I think, like, in that time frame when you focus so – and, I mean, it didn't help you had all the people call it in with, like, different tips, but you focus so heavily on, like, oh, they're runaways, they're runaways. They lost That's exactly what time. happened, too. That's ex- they thought, like, they had ran away to go do this or they had ran away to go do that. And um, when they were found, their mom was like, I told you they did not run away. Like, I told you they did mm-hmm. not run away. And how sad, like, Elvis was – Obviously, he would have found out, like, the girls that he was, like, pleading to go home to their mom. Like, yeah. if you're a real Elvis fan, and they had been murdered. Yeah. Because if and it they're... was just, like, a, if if they were just, like, out wandering, where were their clothes? Yeah, you're not they gonna never go found around, them. You're not going to run around naked in an Illinois winter. Yeah, and in Chicago, 
Yeah. When it's no. free in January. Uh uh-uh. uh. Um That's almost yeah, they a little never sus found from their, a police standpoint. They never found their clothes. They never found um there was like rumors that they found a headscarf, but it wasn't confirmed. They found a yellow sweater just like a couple of miles away, but Loretta said that it wasn't her daughter's, that wasn't their sweater. And their fan club cards came in the mail the next week, mm. which made me really sad. Mm. And Bonnie, when she was found, that was her name, right? Bonnie? Yeah. Bonnie was found decapitated? Yes. Do and, we know the uh, time of year when she was found? Uh, I think she was found in May. Hold on, let me double check. Hmm. Yep, they were found in January 1957. So Bonnie disappeared in September of 1958. And then September 23rd, a man, Charles Milquist, telephoned her home and her mom called the police. So Bonnie's mom got calls as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then on November 15th, 1958. So it was pretty close. I mean, November, December, January, winter months, mm-hmm. a group of Boy Scouts found oh. her during a nature hike. She was also nude. She had been decapitated. Um, and like less it, than two years later, which is so scary that like every two years you're just finding like teenagers, you know, brutally murdered or murdered in general. She had been stabbed several times and her head had been removed. Was her head there? It just says it was removed. I'm guessing it probably was there. Oh, wait. Okay, Hold on. Oh, never mind. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Um, that seems like quite the escalation from just leaving them. But I mean, it does escalate. Yeah. Normally. I would just think that, I don't know, the willingness of people to murder 13 year old girls is probably not the coincidence that this one guy was in the same area. And they're found so close to each other. I don't know. Something about that just makes me go, yeah. And I he was that. found guilty of Bonnie's. He was found guilty of Bonnie's murders, yes. Um, but he was never even talked That's about. Weird. Yeah. And he regularly they probably just stalked women with anonymous calls. He would like knock women unconscious and rape them. He was a rapist. He was just like a all around, not good shitty guy. Yeah. Oof. Damn. That sucks. I hate that it was never solved, but it sounds like maybe it kind of was. Yeah. Were there any guy was doing? No, other than, I mean, Bonnie, but that was it. And there had like after her, there was nothing. Mm hmm. Hmm. Not that I, that would, not that I know of. I mean, there probably could be, but there wasn't anything. Around. This guy was doing, um, like a history. He was researching the history of Chicago, and then he found this case and like got really into it. And this is the kind of one of those instances where this author like reads so much about it that he thinks he solved it. So that happens a lot. That happens a lot. And it's not always wrong. I mean, yeah, if you just, sometimes you just need fresh eyes. Yeah, exactly. I think a lot of them need fresh eyes. <laughs> yeah. There's just, we need more fresh eyes. All of the eyes. What do you guys think? I want to hear theories, what you guys think. Yeah, I know. I don't always. <laughs> I almost told you it was a cold case at the very beginning, and I was like, you know what? I haven't done this to you in a while. You have it. I'm usually the one that does it. <laughs> You're like, uh, I'll never forget the bombing one. Mm-hmm. 
That one traumatized me. He like immediately died. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's um, there it was just it was just wild how many like people. I still can't get over that. Like, That's why do you, really why would weird. you call and say that you? I know that maybe you saw someone and you'd rather be safe than sorry. Like, say something, but like people calling and admitting to it. There were tons of people who said that they were There's some sick people out there. Like we, anytime there are phone calls involved and when a case gets like sensational, sensationalized like this, you really see how many sick people are in the world. Yeah. Like why would you even want to be associated with it? It's just Mm -hmm. crazy. Just crazy. Well, <laughs> I know. It's That's always a- these where we have like bummer endings. You're like, man, now I don't even know what to talk about. I don't even know what to say. We just had our mini, or not mini, we just had our live, right before we recorded this, uh, our live on Discord for our patrons. So again, we will say if you are not a Patreon subscriber, and you want to like hang out with us? We it's nothing like fancy. We literally just like talk, talk about hang whatever. Out. But they did give us the incredible idea to make Spotify playlists, and we're gonna do that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna we do are. It. Yeah, I think we should each make one. We'll make one through our gruesome like uh, account. Yeah, and you can make one that like you listen to, and people can listen to yours, and then you know I'll throw mine on there. I love that. So we're gonna make. Not like murder playlists, like what we listen to in a given day. It's real weird. I listen to a lot of really random stuff. You're going to be like, Connie, what are you listening to? (laughs) I feel like most people do. Most people, some days I listen to TED Talks. Some days I listen to hardcore rap. It just really depends. You know, it's weird. I (laughs) love podcasts. Some days I listen to Slayer. It just, you never know. I love podcasts so much and I listen to a ton of different ones of all genres, but I can't do TED Talks. Really? I lately have been feeling very um, not motivated and like demotivated, I guess. Mm -hmm. Drained. And so I was try. I have, I like to listen to like inspirational TED Talks. Like, I can't even think of any (laughs) to give you an example, but um, they just, I don't know, they make me feel better. I might have to try it. Like when I get into like my ADHD funks where I'm like stuck in this ADHD loop of where nothing gets done and then I feel guilty that nothing's getting done. And it's just- Yeah, I have listened to, um, I have listened to an ADHD TED Talk too about like how it's, it's good. It's a good thing. If I can, I'll find it and I'll send it to you. But um, I just, I don't know. Sometimes always, it just needs some motivation. I always say that. Like I, you know, you grow up and you go to school and you always hear people like talking about ADHD. Like it's like, oh, they have ADHD. They have ADD. And I like to think of it now, like it is frustrating at times, but some of my best traits that I think and like what people have told me they like about me are like the side effects of my ADHD. So, you know, I think it's kind of, it's not it's so good. Bad. Yeah. You got to find the, uh, it's like the, the golden lining, silver lining. Yeah. Silver lining. You have golden to learn. Lining. And I think this goes to say, and I know I'm going to have someone be like, you don't know anything about mental health. Like you just stop talking. But, uh, I think it goes to say with any mental health issue you may have, anything that you're struggling, like if you learn to like kind of just embrace the waves and just like be able to recognize, I think that's the biggest thing is like recognizing, like sometimes I recognize that I am in like a paralysis, especially if I have a lot of stuff to do and it's overwhelming and I just get paralyzed and I don't do anything at all. So I think being able to recognize like this is what's happening right now, being able to like vocalize it. I can't always change it. Like I stared at my computer screen at work today. I know I have so much to do because I'm going to be off work for a week and I got nothing done because I panicked and I just stared at the screen and I was like, you know, you feel overwhelmed. But I think being able to be like, I recognize that this is happening and be able to like 
sit with it, it's it really does make a difference. You describing it as paralysis um, is perfect. That's what I mean by demotivated. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I was just like, I'll just do nothing instead. (laughs) That will somehow make me feel better. And it didn't. No, it makes you feel guilty. It makes you feel worse, yeah. (laughs) But like then you – I feel like my biggest superpower is how well I work under my procrastination and under pressure. So, you know. I get to that, le- like, I have to pack an entire, for an entire week, a week away for me, my family, my husband will pack his stuff, whatever, but I got to do everything else. And I have to, like, work and we have baseball. It's, like, a lot of stuff, but I'm, like, approaching tomorrow, like, man, I'm about to dominate because I know that I work best under pressure. This one day, that's all I need. Just one day. One day in a time, in a ticking time bomb it's that i need that like impending doom like i need I that it. to be able to like be like <gasps> and then i get my best work that's how you guys get my episodes every week <laughs> well and that's like i'll research for weeks and weeks so yeah, I you just like sit- read and understand but then you have to go to actually like we we talk from a script so yeah, I have to actually go and like I we have to type it all out and I usually say I mean I can crank it out. I've gotten pretty efficient with how much I can like type and how fast I can do it. But I will research to the point of like I could tell the story in my sleep. But it's like the actual putting the pen to paper. I'm like, "Ah." Yeah, okay. it can be. I feel that. And so when you type, sorry, I needed to tell people this. When you type, it sounds like a cartoon typing. And I think of it every time you do it, like it's always really fast and like very hard and loud. It's like, like that's oh, what I, I imagine. A, I have a mechanical keyboard. So you get if, a tippy tappy keyboard. I have a tippy tappy keyboard. You'll be like, one sec when we're talking and you'll go and type it. It's like, and it just always reminds me of like yeah. a scene from a cartoon. It makes me laugh. Yes. Yeah, I like it. Or like, um, like pretend, like somebody pretending to type in like a movie or something. That's what I think. That gives me. I was vibes. typing, um, and I was like writing my episode a few weeks ago, and my husband was playing uh, car soccer on his computer, and he turned and looked at me. He's like, "Are you for real right now?" And I'm like, "What?" Because like he got me onto the mechanical keyboard because I used to hate them, but now he's like, "I wish I wouldn't have because you were just like." <laughs> But I type like it's really like, put your headphones on. <laughs> like if you want, if anyone is listening and you want to square up in a typing competition, like speed competition, come at me, sis. You're going to lose or bro. I, um, I do not want to square up because I still hunt and peck. I still no, look at my keyboard. Yeah, I do. Like I'll look at them and I'll like, I can, I cannot look at them, but I choose to look at them like half of the time, probably 50% of the time I'm like, making sure I'm hitting the right keys. Nope. I just, my hands work as fast as my brain and as fast as I talk, it just goes. Sometimes the only time I really don't do it is when I'm like in class and I'm taking notes off of like a screen and I will watch the screen because they change the PowerPoint so fast. Like if I look away for one second, that's gone and I'll never see it again. Is it just they're talking and you have to type what they're talking because you should just, Get like I have a note or an app where like it transcribes it and it just writes it all. I out can. For me. I have done that before, um, but normally they don't post the powerpoints. Oh, I so, see. So and then we have like, so we have like a like a set of notes that we just get. It's like a packet of notes for each mm-hmm. like section, which is very generous. Um, but normally on tests and stuff they will reference something they said not something that was on the powerpoint so if they're they're talking through the powerpoint and i'm referencing them with my notes and then they say something and they emphasize it that's not in the notes or on the powerpoint really i always like make sure to like type that out and like pull from the words that they're yeah. using that were it's College. it's taken me this long to get there i know you're One there though year, baby you're One there. more year, and I will probably be like, all right, what's the next one? 
I do learn well when I take notes. But then I go back and I will write something, even if I'm like writing a to-do list. So I write my to-do list and then I go back in and then I rewrite my to-do list like four different times, especially if I like start to write it. I'm like, I don't like the way that looks. Rip it out. Do it again. Oh, it's, yeah. I do that. It's I write gross. it and then I rewrite it in order from like most to least important like what mm -hmm. do I, I for, so I write all the things I have to do and then I write a cute one that's most least important and then like I block that into time so like the most important thing I think it's going to take me two hours today so I'm going to do that this one's going to take me 20 minutes so I'm going to do that next and I do that all the way down I do like when I write my grocery list um even though I order all of my groceries online I will write out every week what I'm having for dinner and yep. then I will write a second list that gives me all of the locations, like all of like. Yeah. By like section. Yeah. Yep. And that makes I'll perfect sense to me. Another list and it will go based off of what type of grocery it is. Produce, dairy, meat. So like as I'm doing my grocery shopping, like even though I'm like doing it through an app. I can know that I'm checking off every single thing that I need to get. You're not it's, missing anything. Yeah. But like also uh, go to write like uh, I could be like happy birthday on a piece of paper and I'll write that same happy birthday like 15 times. I'm going to make pieces. sure it's going to look cute in the card. Yeah. Like it's just it's practice. Just, <laughs> it's insane. My husband came in once and I had uh, I don't even know what the list I was writing. But I wrote the same one. And he's like, what are you doing? Because it would be like, I would get a little bit further and then I would see it. I'm like, I don't like the way that looks. And I'd rip the picture off and then I would start again. And then, and then sometimes I don't finish the list because it took so much to get so much mental effort to even get to the point. No, it's fine. It you gotta, gotta do what you gotta do to get through. All right. Well, now that you guys know how freaking weird we are, me. <laughs> we'll see you next. We don't judge. Be weird. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Bye.